In this video, we are going to state and prove Seeloff's third theorem about Seeloff P subgroups. If G is a finite group and if P is a prime dividing uh, the order of G, well, by the first Seeloff subgroup theorem, uh, first Seeloff theorem, we know that Seeloff P subgroups exist. And by the second Seeloff sub, subgroup theorem, we know that all Seeloff P subgroups are conjugates of each other. Um, in the third theorem, so we, we've proven so far as they, we've proven they exist. They're all conjugates of each other. And in the third theorem, we're actually going to count how many Seeloff P subgroups can we have. And this is a very, very important result, especially as we start studying simple groups in the not-too-distant future. Well, the next lecture for this lecture series. Uh, it turns out by the third theorem here that the number of Seeloff P subgroups of a group is congruent to 1 mod P, and it has to divide the order of G. For which, let me point out to you here that in particular, if you can factor the order of G as P to the R times M, such that P doesn't divide M, meaning that P to the R is the maximum power of P that divides G right there, that's all the powers of P. In that situation, uh, because of these conditions, the number of Seeloff P subgroups is congruent to 1 mod P and divides G. So that number divides G, so it means it has to divide this. But if that number is 1 mod P, that means that it's going to have to divide M right here. So using this number M, we can actually consider how many Seeloff P subgroups could the group possibly have. And that consideration has some very interesting applications, which, like I said, we will explore those in later videos. So as seen above, G acts on the Seeloff P subgroups by conjugation. This is just a... This is, this is something that's easy to see, I suppose, but in particular by the Seeloff second, the Seeloff second theorem, um, this action is a single orbit. If we look at the action of the Seeloff P subgroups, you have some P1, some P2, some P3, all the way down to PK, the number of Seeloff P subgroups here. This is one orbit, and G can act on this set by conjugation. Therefore, the size of this orbit is the index of the normalizer of any Seeloff subgroup. And this is something that we get from the fundamental counting principle. So when G acts on the Seeloff subgroups by conjugation, we know that K, the size of this orbit, is gonna equal the index of G with respect to the normalizer of any of these ones. It doesn't matter which one you choose, they're all the same because they're all in there. Um, in particular, indices always divide the order of the group. And so that gives us the very first one, right? The number of subgroups we have, because it's a single orbit by the second theorem, um, that, that number K is an index of a group because of the fundamental counting principle. So it divides the order of G. This is a consequence of Lagrange's theorem. So that gives us the second statement right here. So what we have to prove is that this number is, this number K is also one mod p. Now to do that, we're going to fix our attention on a single Seeloff p subgroup. Let's call it capital P. And I claim that this group p also acts on the Seeloff p subgroups by conjugation. Now it takes the orbit we had before, but it's going to break it up into smaller orbits. One of them is pretty clear. One of them is just going to be P itself. Because after all, if I take an element that's in P and then I conjugate P by it, because it's a subgroup, it's closed under multiplication. Um, so we're going to end up with, well, this is just going to be P. Um, and so there's one element all by itself when we restrict the action just to capital P. I claim that there are no other fixed points in this situation. And to prove that, we're gonna use lemma 1515 that we proved in the very first video for lecture seven. Take a look at that one if you don't know what I'm talking about right now. But let me just remind you what it says, that let P be a Seeloff P subgroup of G, let X be an element of G whose order is a power of P. Um, if X belongs to the normalizer of that Seeloff subgroup, then X actually belongs to that Seeloff subgroup itself. That's what that tells us. So if there's some other Seeloff subgroup that was all by itself, that means that X, Q, X inverse would equal Q, which would mean X belongs to 
the normalizer of Q, but as the order of X is some power of P because X belongs to a CLF subgroup by Lagrange's theorem, its order, since it's a power of P, all elements will have a power of P order, um, then that lemma applies and forces that X actually belongs to Q, which means Q and P were the same Seeloff subgroup there. Um, and so, you know, th there's no other fixed points. That's what we're trying to say here. So okay. thus, there's no other fixed points. You're going to have some P2, some P3 going on. Um, and then you can have a bunch of these other ones. There's no other fixed points. There's just the one right here. So if we come and look at the class equation, we often use the class equation for conjugation of a group on itself, but the class equation works for any group action whatsoever. For which remember what the class equation tells us, if we have a group action, take the G set X, it can be partitioned with respect to the orbits, right? Um, let's take all of the orbits of fixed points which a fixed point means that its orbit is just a single element. If we put all of those singletons together, we're going to get this stable set X sub P here. P is the acting group in this situation. And then we add together all of the non-trivial orbits. Uh, what's going to happen in that situation? Well, as we observe, there's only one Seeloff P subgroup that's fixed by capital P, and that was P itself. So X sub P will have only one. What about these other ones? These other orbits by the fundamental counting principle are going to be, uh, they're going to be indices that look something like this, but it's a little bit different. It's going to look like P dot, um, well, some other things. It's the normalizer with what's going on here. We talked about this previously, but I actually don't care what that is. If you take an index of a subgroup of P that has to divide P, where P's order is P to the R. And so each of these orbits is some power of P. It might not be all of PR, probably not, uh, but these are going to be powers of a prime. So the size of X, the number of Seeloff P subgroups is one plus a bunch of powers of P, non-trivial powers of P. So if you reduce that mod P, all of these things disappear and you're left with just one, which then finishes uh, the proof of the third theorem of Seeloff. So to finish this video, I want to provide some examples of this theorem here. So consider you have a subgroup of order six, which six, of course, factors as two times three. Um, by Seeloff's third theorem, if we want to consider the possible three groups, um, the number, sometimes we use a symbol like n sub k for, uh, you know, this is n sub k is the number of Seeloff three subgroups. This is not a standard notation, but it's used from time to time. Um, it's convenient in this situation. So you can think of n sub k. This is the size of Seeloff uh, P of G, like so. So we're asking, you know, what would n3 be? Well, what we saw from the, from the third theorem is n3 divides six, but n3 is also congruent to one mod three. So how many numbers divide six? but are one mod three. So one divides six, two does, but that doesn't work. Three does, but that doesn't work. And then you get six, which doesn't work either. Um, in particular, because you have to divide six, but you have to be one mod three, it has to divide two um, and be one mod six. So one's the only possibility when it comes to when it comes to N3, you only get one. So every group of order six has a unique Seeloff three subgroup. I want you to consider the two groups of order six. You have Z6 and S3. Um, Z6 has a unique subgroup, looking at that real quick. It has a unique subgroup of order three. It's isomorphic to Z3. It has a unique subgroup of order two, and then you have the trivial subgroup. It has only one subgroup of order three, just like we predicted. What about S3? Well, you have the alternating group A3. You're gonna have um, you're gonna have three subgroups that are isomorphic to Z2. If we look at the lattice of all these subgroups, but in particular, you have a subgroup, a unique subgroup of order three. Now, I should mention that as a consequence of Seeloff's second theorem, that if you have a unique Seeloff subgroup, it has to be normal uh, because it's going to have the conjugate of a Seeloff P 
P subgroup is a CLOF P subgroup. Um, if there's only one of them, it's going to have to equal itself. And I guess you don't need Seeloff second theorem. That's just true in general, that if you have a unique subgroup of a given order, it'll be normal. And so if there's only one Seeloff P subgroup, then it's the only one of that order. So it's going to be normal. That's a very important thing. So every group of order six has a normal subgroup of order three. But in retrospect, that's not too surprising. Order three means your index two. And we've seen before that every subgroup of index two has to be normal. So this is the Seeloff theory sort of overkill in this situation. But it's starting to show to you why that could be useful. Well, what about two groups? Okay, how many Seeloff two groups could you have? Well, by the C by Seeloff's third theorem, we have that N2 has to be a number which divides six and is one mod two, which if you're one mod two, that actually means you'd have to divide three and be one mod two, but that gives you one and three. So there are some possibilities here. If you look at Z6, it has a unique subgroup of order two. But S3 has three subgroups of order two. These were the two possibilities that Seeloff's third theorem uh, allowed for us. And all of these possibilities were in fact realized. Let me clean up my screen a little bit. Um, let's come down here and talk about groups of order 12 for a moment. What type of Seeloff subgroups can you have with a group of order 12? Well, if you look at N3 for a moment, we need a number which divides four, but is one mod three. One is always gonna work in that situation. You could always get at least one. You always get at least one, uh, but you also could get four. Two divides four, but it's two mod three. Four divides four and is one mod three. So that's a possibility. You could get one or four. What about N2? Well, N2 is gonna be just like we saw before. Um, N2, if you take away the two part, you have to be one mod two and you have to divide 12, which means you're gonna divide three in this situation. You get one and three. So these are the possibilities we could get. We could get a unique subgroup of order three and order four. We could get maybe a non-trivial, uh, you could get three subgroups of order two, order four actually maybe, um, or maybe we could get four and one, or maybe we can get four and three. These are these, these four possibilities here. Not all of them are realizable um, because of reasons we'll talk about in later lectures, but I do wanna show you some examples of this. If you look at Z12 for a moment, Z12, it has as its lattice of subgroups, we got Z6, we got Z4, we got Z3, we got Z2, and we got one like so. In particular, it has a unique subgroup of order three and it has a unique subgroup of order four. These are the Seeloff three and two subgroups respectively. So for Z12, we get that N2 is one and we get that N3 is one. That's a possibility. Um, what if we switch over to the alternating group? Okay, what does it look like? Well, in terms of its groups, a4, you have the Klein 4 group, which has order 4. It contains three subgroups of order 2. So these are going to be cyclic subgroups of order 2. And then you also have these subgroups of order 3 floating around. It'll have four of those. So just drawing the Hase diagram here. Like so. And so if you start to count what are the Seeloff subgroups, you have your Seeloff uh, two subgroup right there. There's only one of them, it's normal. Um, but you have three, excuse me, you have four Seeloff three subgroups, just like we said before. So that is a possibility. We had one and one, we then had four and one when it comes to A4. And then if we look at another group of order 12, take D6 for example, um, D6, I erased my numbers there. Uh, N3 could equal one and four. N2 could equal one and three. What happens with D6? Uh, I'm not gonna draw the entire lattice. I mean, I guess I could, it's, it's not so bad. If we did D6, um, D6 of course is gonna contain a cyclic subgroup of order six, which gives us Z2 and it gives us Z3. And this all sits above, above the identity like so. You also have these uh, you're going to have a bunch of the reflections there. So you should have like six of those. 
over here, and then I can draw some more over here, Z2, Z2, and Z2, like so. Um, so what else can you get? Um, if you brought this Z2 with the Z3 together, you're going to form a dihedral group, a D3, and that actually would get all of these. Same thing over here, this dihedral group, boom, 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 and boom. Um, if you were to bring together uh, various uh, various of these Z2s, uh, you bring, bring them together and form a Klein 4 group. You get something like this. And then you're going to get several of these. And this is kind of where it gets messy. And this was my hesitancy to draw this. But if you bring these together, um, you get all of these Klein 4 groups. And then we'll do one more over here. Bring that one together, bring that one together, bring that one together. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say here is in this picture, you're going to get a unique subgroup of order three, like so. Um, that's going to give you this right here. But you're going to get three different Klein 4 groups, which are going to be your Seeloff 2 subgroups. So we do, in fact, get this. So we see all the possibilities now. Um, we can get a subgroup, which gets one and one. We can get a subgroup, we can get a group that gets one and three. We can get one that does four and one. It turns out that four and three is not possible. And that's mostly because it counts too many elements. Um, because if you have if you have four um four Seeloff three subgroups, that's those are gonna be four times you know this Z3 right here. Um, these elements are gonna contain some element, it's inverse, it's square in the identity. So if you just count these ones, you're going to get eight elements right there. So eight elements of order three, right? Now we've counted these eight elements of order three. If we take those away from everything else, 12 minus eight, you end up with four elements left. And you have to have at least one Seeloff two subgroup, which has order four. So this right here is the Seeloff two subgroup. Um, these four elements, it's a Klein four group, or maybe it's a cyclic group of order four. It doesn't really matter. You've accounted for all of them. So it turns out the option of four and three isn't possible. But this argument that we did here, these possible considerations, these, when used correctly, can be very powerful tools in group theory. And we'll talk about those more in the next video.